Um, so before we get started, I just wanted to do a little bit of housekeeping. Um, my name is Caitlin and I work at Square Books. Thank you all for coming. Um, I want to tell you all about a couple of upcoming events. I'll try to keep it brief, but we have a lot of really good ones. So um, here we go. Uh, tomorrow at five o'clock, we'll be hosting a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist, John Archibald, for his memoir, Shaking the Gates of Hell. And he will be joined in conversation with a uh, Oxonian and fellow writer, David McGee. That's at five o'clock. Um, next Thursday, April 8th. Um, this is technically YA, but I think it's, you know, YA is just marketing and it's going to be a great event. So um, uh, we'll have um, Brittany Morris um, for her new novel, The Cost of Knowing. And she's going to be joined in conversation with the uh, very wonderful Angie Thomas, who I'm sure y'all all know from uh, Hate You Give and Concrete Rose. Um, and then next is Saturday, uh, April 10th at 1 p.m. So this is kind of a matinee event, something new for us. But um, we'll be having uh, hosting Kevin Brockmeyer with, uh, for the Ghost Variations and Karen Tidbeck for the Memory Theater. These are both weird, wonderful, beautiful books. Um, I'm really excited to hear them talk about it. Um, I hope you can join us. And then finally, because you may be here for the historical fiction um, element of Cloudmaker, uh, we're hosting Martha Hall Kelly on Thursday, April 15th at 5 p.m. for her new novel, Sunflower Sisters. Some um, three women making their way through Civil War America and she'll be joined in conversation with Lisa Wingate. Um, but enough about them. We are uh, here tonight for uh, Cloudmaker, written by Malcolm Brooks. Um, a little bit about Malcolm. Uh, he was raised in the rural foothills of the California Sierras, a carpenter by trade. He has lived in Montana for most of two decades. His writing has appeared in Gray's Sporting Journal, Outside, Sports, A Field, and Montana Quarterly, among others. I'm sure you all remember him from um, Painted Horses. He was here in 2014 for that wonderful book that is still um, Square Book's favorite. Our host this evening is Julia Whalen. She's an actor, writer, and narrator of over 400 audiobooks. Um, if you are a Libro.fm subscriber, I'm sure that you have heard her. Uh, she has won numerous awards, including a 2019 Best Female Narrator Audi for Tara Westover's Educated in a Sovas Award for the performance of her own internationally best-selling novel, My Oxford Year, which was published by HarperCollins in 2018. Audiophile Magazine, is that right? Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, Audiophile Magazine named her one of its golden voices this past year, and she's also a Grammy-nominated audiobook director, as well as a certified T sommelier. Um, all right. Well, I will leave it to you two. Um, we're so excited to um, celebrate and talk about Cloudmaker. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. And um, please submit your questions in the Q&A. Well, hi. Hi. How are hi. you? Hi. I'm so glad we're doing this. Me too. Um, so what we talked about a little bit before you, you all came in uh, is that usually these things kick off with a reading, but Malcolm um, asked if I would do the reading, <laughs> which is kind of my job. So I'm uh, I'm just going to read from the first couple of pages of the book just to uh, just to drop you right into the world of Cloudmaker. Malcolm, do you want to set anything up, or since it's the beginning of the book, is it just the beginning of the book? Oh, I don't, yeah, I don't know. I guess I'll set it up a little bit. Um, in, in, at least, you know, insofar as to say that this is set um, in the, during the Great Depression in central Montana. It's 1937. And uh, the, the novel itself is inspired by some real life teenagers who in that era were building and flying their own airplanes. So what we have in the, in the opening of the book is one of these, one of these boys uh, and his sort of little uh, precocious literary buddy, Raleigh, who has nicknamed him Huck because his last name is Finn. His name is Houston Finn, but Raleigh calls him Huck Finn. So Huck Finn has built a glider, which Raleigh is going to attempt to hoist him aloft in, uh, in the middle of the night so that they can avoid the, the local constable. So that's great. All gonna, yeah. Okay, I'm gonna put my glasses on for this. Okay. Um, and if I, if I screw up, I don't have a microphone. I can't go back. So I'm just gonna, 
I'm just gonna keep going like, like Huck. Okay, prologue. Scorpio slides down and Orion stalks up and the stars in the October sky otherwise align. An eight-cylinder Buick Roadster with out-of-state plates and nails and two tires had limped in off the highway at dusk. She rests now nine hours later in the wash of light from the open door of the shop, new tubes in place and the convertible top down, and the rightful owner in a boarding house not two blocks away, unaware of his contribution to any of this. The kid hits the ignition, and the cold car jolts and roars like a cat. Withered leaves jump in a blast of exhaust, and he works the pedal, feels as much as hears the engine's high-tuned rumble. The leaves skitter again. He's endured months for hope of this moment exactly, and with the Montana winter lurking just to the north, he knows it's either now or hold off until spring, eternity to a 14-year-old. Here is the fastest car to appear in Big Cooley in at least a year. He's actually gone so far as to pray for such, and with the prize dropped right in his lap, he can't help believing he's received not simply an answer, but a bona fide green light from God. Even Pop knows the score, put him on the pierced tires with a wink and a nod and made himself conspicuously scarce. He backs the car around the side of the shop and Raleigh appears like a red ghost in the taillights. Behind him, the wide wing of the glider, a fainter red blur against the night. Huck walks back and the two of them wordlessly take opposite sides and roll the ship forward, tiny spoked wheels greased and silent, the luminous sailcloth bobbing. Looks like a galdern giant moth, Raleigh mumbles, and he's right, or at least not wrong, or at least not wrong in this diffuse red light. Still, glider number one looks to Huck entirely of a piece with the legendary experimental flyers of Orville and Wilbur Wright from four decades past, with its overhead wing and skeletonized rib section connecting the tail and rear flaps to the operator's chair. Actually, nothing more than a plank atop the axle and a corresponding plank out front for a footrest. Only the cookie cutter wheels appear truly misfit, repurposed as they are from a baby buggy and looking absurdly out of scale beneath 23 feet of wingspan. He wonders if this occurs to Raleigh as well. They hitch 40 feet of hemp line to the bumper and attach the tag to another 10 of shock cord with a spliced steel ring at each end, the second of which mates to a release on the ship's footrest. Raleigh straightens up. All set? Huck weaves between cables, ducks beneath the wing. He settles to the narrow plank and reaches for the leather helmet on self-administered loan from the high school football supply. He screws the helmet down and cinches the strap. He peers up at Raleigh. How do I look? Like Tom Swift in his airship. Raleigh looks over at the bungalow, dark as a morgue. Reckon your pap's watching. Huck tests the scissor-like levers jutting between his thighs, works the pair of them back and forth. He can feel the tips of the wing torque and twist through the tension of the cables. Pop? Far as I know, Pop's been in bed since nine. That is our story. You ready? Born ready. Remember, middle of the street, get me under the wires at second and light her up. 40 by fourth, 40 by fourth. Way I've got her figured, I can cut loose by the time you get to the church and you can hook south and sneak on back. I'll sail out over the ball diamond and set her down. Don't crash, I might. Don't die, I won't. Raleigh crawls out in first gear with the headlamps cut and the parking lamps low. The slack goes out of the rope, and the rope comes off the ground and tightens into the shock cord, stretches the elastic out of the cord, and yanks the glider forward in a jump. Huck hears the shift into second, and steady, they roll down the street. Bravo. You did that much better than I would. <laughs> <laughs> You're, uh, what's funny is I, I was noticing as I was recording it, because this took me you know, longer than, uh, longer than your average bear. And it's because you have such a um, unique syntax. And in this book, particularly, it's slightly um, archaic, a little bit to me. And so I would find myself getting halfway through a sentence and then be like, wait, 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 <laughs> where, where are we going? And it's so beautiful when it's nailed. Like when when I when I would hit it, it would just soar like an airplane. And I love that so much about your writing. Um, 
but uh, I do feel like I, I finally got into it. Like halfway through the book, I was like, okay. And so now I can go back and read the first page yeah, you know, that, three months that, later. It's okay. It. Perfect. <laughs> um, so, well, for everyone that's here, uh, I recorded um, Cloudmaker, but I also recorded Malcolm's first book, Painted Horses. Um, and it is one of my favorite books that I've ever recorded. And I have been anxiously awaiting this one. So it's been... Um, just it's so wonderful that you finally have a second book out in the world and that it's this good thank you yeah i i was insistent that you be the person to read it if at all possible because i you know we were talking about this previously but i was really not an audiobook listener to speak of prior to my novel, my first novel coming out. And I was, you know, curious to see what the experience was like, especially, you know, listening to my own work. And I was so blown away by Julia's performance in that, that, you know, I, and I, I've told her this before, but I mean, it was, it made me look at my own book in different ways that I hadn't thought of before. So when we finally got to the point where Cloudmaker was ready for the same treatment, I, I was like, I want Julia to do this if at all possible and luckily it worked out so. well it's very I, I and I really appreciate that obviously it's lovely to hear the compliments but it's also you know we in the way audiobooks are sort of typically cast you wouldn't assume that I would do your work like right. it's not it's not a one-for-one one casting choice and so um when you were telling me about Cloudmaker and you said you know I really want you to do it and I was like well hang on is it is it like first person female like is it all from Annalise's perspective and you kept saying no it's it's third person and it's kind of in these different you know it's got these different sections and and I just like I'm really flattered honestly that you wanted me to to do it and be responsible for that well I mean again I mean we've talked about this before the level of complexity with painted horses and I, I wouldn't envy anyone you know having to <laughs> Because there's, you know, there's French in it and there's Basque tinted accents in it. And I was going to say there is French with a Basque accent. Right. I want all the credit for that. <laughs> I, have all the credit. I didn't, I didn't even know how Alicia Beta's name was pronounced until I listened to the audio book. And I was like, oh, well, that's how that's pronounced. There we go. There we go. So, yeah. um, so everyone, we're going to talk for probably about 25 minutes or so. Um, if you have a question, throw it up in the Q&A and I'll check then. I probably won't check before then just so I'm not distracted. But um, if you've got any questions for either one of us, um, put it in there. Um, so how long was the writing process for Painted Horses? Let's just start there. Uh... I did a fair amount of research on that book for probably at least a year prior to writing anything except notes. But once I got into writing the actual narrative, I, I was hoping I could have a draft in two years, but it actually took me five years to the week to get a full draft of it. But that wasn't full-time writing either. I mean, I was day job, you know, Sure. Most of the time and I'm self-employed. I'm a carpenter. So I was able to take, you know, a couple of months every winter and really dedicate myself to the writing of it. But then I would also be away from it for months at a time as well. But yeah, it, right. it, it wound up being, you know, an aggregate, a five-year process. And so did that process change for this book? Did it take about the same amount of time? Because it's been it's been seven years between publication dates, but that's not necessarily... Right. How long it took to write? No, I mean, it was quicker to write Cloudmaker because I was able to block out like a year and a half and just work on it. I, you know, okay. I had enough of a financial windfall um, between the advance I got for it and then royalties off painted horses. So uh, it took, let's see, I started the actual writing of it in probably March of 2015. And I got a full draft of it in January or February of 2018. So it, okay. was, it was about a three year period. And did you sit down knowing the book you wanted to write or were you kind of feeling your way through it as you were writing? Well, I had been thinking about it for a number of years. Um, was know, it just, like your side project? Like, were you cheating on Painted Horses with it I'm a little not, bit? Not cheating on it so much in terms okay. of like sneaking away to write on it, but definitely, right. <laughs> you know, attempting to read things that would pertain to it and, 
you know, and, and learn as much as I could about, you know, this historic home built airplane culture that existed. And then just also, you know, constantly thinking about, well, what other, and I, and I know I tend to get pretty ambitious with, you know, plot arcs and, you know, subplots and all of this stuff that has to then somehow these sort of parallel strands that have to somehow tie up into a bow at the end of the book. So I think I'm sort of constantly thinking about ways to do that consciously or unconsciously um, when I'm not technically actively working on the book, i.e. typing away or whatever. And did you pick the, the particular, like the actual moment in time in which the narrative exists because it was Amelia Earhart's last flight? Yeah, um, the the plane, the real life airplane that this is most inspired by was actually built in 1933. But once I came up with Annalise's character, um, it was just such a no brainer to have the Amelia Earhart, you know, dimension in there. Um, especially because of the Amy Semple McPherson in, um, appearance. And I thought, well, if I could balance these two, and I, yeah, to be totally honest with you, I can't even remember how I cooked that up. But once it struck me, I was like, wow, we've got these two women in the same era who were both masters of sort of media manipulation, but towards very different ends. Aims, and, yeah. Yeah, very different aims, very different directions. So I just, yeah, I thought it would be an interesting you know, interesting thing to play around with. Yeah, definitely. Um, so when you, you, you clearly had some research going into it, and I guess this is a general question because I'm just, I've always been fascinated by historical fiction and the process of, of writing it on all sides of it from, you know, the more very, the ones that hew very closely to the research or sure. the ones that just sprinkle it on like seasoning. Um, did you, you started with some concept of the, the research you knew you were going to base the novel on, but do you like to just do all the research first and then sit down and try to just write pages unimpeded or are you stopping constantly looking things up, going back and forth? What's, what's that process? It's a little, and you can say, is it different? If it's different for either book, feel yeah. free to, you know. Well, I guess one thing that I have to sort of note about both both books is th they really are um they're hinged around historical time periods and historical things that I already had sort of a long-term pre-existing interest in so I mean with, with Painted Horses for example i had been really interested in the post-blitz archaeology in London for a long long time um and and the the you know the painted caves in Europe I mean that I've been obsessed with that stuff for three years uh, with, with Cloudmaker, it's more, it wasn't necessarily like a vintage aviation buff per se, but any old thing like that can get its hooks into me. And I just get really fascinated by it. And when I saw that first uh, airplane, which it, it, it's currently in the Museum of the Rockies uh, in Bozeman, Montana, it was donated by the family after they'd stored it in their barn for 70 years or something. Um, so it hangs from the ceiling now and you'd go in and take a look at it and it's just like, well, it's clearly a real airplane. And it's also very clearly kind of a raggedy homemade thing. And so it was, it was just fascinating to see this item. Um, so I started, to, I, I had to research the plane stuff more than a lot of the other basic dimensions of the, the novel for historical flavor, because I already had a pre-existing sense of like depression era, you know, values and depression era, you know, phenomena, personalities, you know, Amelia Earhart. Amy, Amy Semple McPherson. I mean, I already knew some stuff about them. Th that said, I mean, I, I'm constantly trying to fine tune and tweak little tiny details all the time. Like, um, how, how would a radio have worked then? You know, how, how would they have gotten electricity to an unelectrified rural area back then? You know, so stuff like that, as I encounter like little minutia as I'm going, and I realized that I've got these sort of details that I need to flesh out. The, so, so the research is an ongoing thing, just not necessarily in the big picture, you know, sense of it. Do you try to, do you just kind of like barrel past it when you're writing and like put a note being like research electricity? No. Or you actually stop and. 
a lot of times I do. And I don't know if it's good or bad because I feel like you might be making that really hard on yourself. (laughs) I think they're now some huge rabbit holes with this stuff where, I mean, I might not write so much as a paragraph for a full day because I've just gotten so sidetracked by something. But then there will be these like flashes of inspiration while you're in the middle of that. And you can see some other aspect of, or, or some other just brilliant detail that yes. is, is, is useful. I mean, maybe later on in the narrative, you know? Yeah, no, that's, I mean, that is, that is where a lot of the magic happens for sure. Yeah. Um, but I, I do, you do wonder, and I mean, maybe part of it is like, if you've, if you've written enough of the book that you feel like you have a sense of the, its voice and you're in it, then you don't necessarily need to worry about leaving it for too long. But like you said, if you were taking months off, you know, away from it, hard to get back into it. Yeah. I guess the other thing too, and it's a little bit off topic, but I mean, I know that these books qualify as historical fiction, but I don't think I necessarily approach them in a conventional historical fiction sense. I mean, I'm, I really just want to write vivid, realistic characters who say funny and off the cuff and insightful and poignant things and, you know, just create a world that's around them. These two books happen to be set in the past, but the reconstruction of the past and having the past itself be the primary sort of character in the book is really not the way I tend to think about it, I don't think. So then what do you think, it, what do you think it gives a story? Do you think it gives a sense of dramatic irony that the reader knows something the characters don't and that adds a layer of depth to what you're writing? Or like if that were true, because some of your discursive, like the whole section about, um, you know, Gilroy's father. Oh, yeah. Is like so incredible. And that could be a standalone novel in its own right. Um, so there is something I feel I feel like there that's part of what I mean, I would love to read a contemporary novel of yours, don't get me wrong. But if that's the case, like what what do you think the historical stuff brings to it? Um, I think in part a sense of the mythic almost and a sense of the archetypal. Um, I know that I guess sort of philosophically one of the things I'm real, one of the questions I'm really interested in, I guess just existentially, is how does the past and what happened in the past continue to influence who we are in the present now? Right. So I think that's part of it. Part of it is just probably haven't been kind of a history nut my whole life Uh, you know I have a you know what I guess a lot of people would probably regard as a somewhat retrograde sensibility in general so (laughs) (laughs) yeah the past is just fascinating to me but I believe that the past was peopled with with individuals who were not so unlike us I agree I mean look like I said I it's it's I I love it I've I've always loved it. It's definitely my favorite um, category. I, yeah. It's what I enjoy reading and um, it's what I enjoy writing up until I wrote a contemporary novel. And then I was like, well, okay, I guess I'm doing that now. Well, um, a great contemporary novel too. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, so a quick question about your, your writing process. So as you said, um, and this has to do with the question of like when you listen to the audiobook and you heard the story a little bit differently than you had, you know, it was just a a new way of hearing your own story, of metabolizing your own story. When you're writing, are you thinking about adaptation? Like, are you seeing a film in your head when you're writing? Are you hearing it? What kind of, like, are you just so focused on words on the page that you're not doing that? No, I mean, I I definitely uh, see it and act it out even to a degree, Uh, sometimes unwittingly and unconsciously, I think. I mean, I, and this happens all the time, multiple times a week. I mean, one of my kids will just be like that. You're talking to yourself again. And, you know, I'll just be rambling on or, you know, somebody from the next room will say, did you say something? And and I'll realize that I did, that that I've been sort of acting this stuff out unconsciously, you know, on on my own. So, yeah, I, I think that I do have an almost kind of 
kind of a tour type, you know, <laughs> where I am seeing like, I think I say something, you know, like that in Painted Horses where Catherine has a movie in her head about her own life. I think, yeah, I think I see it and, and hear it and, and perceive these characters as being real people, I guess. Do you see, do you see the characters? I just, a friend of mine had said on Instagram the other day that it occurred to her through a conversation she was having with some other people that she doesn't see the faces or hear the voices of her character. She has like a sense of their presence and who they are, but she couldn't, she's not, she's not big on the personal description. That said, she's like, I know where all of their refrigerators are. Right. Like, cause I'm always moving them to things. <laughs> um, how do you, do you see, do you see the characters when you're writing? Yeah, yeah definitely. And sometimes I'll have a, you know, an, uh, I'll have a match in my head to a specific person that I knew at one time, or, you know, maybe still know, um, who's just like, you know, or, or just a, a certain type of person. I mean, there, there've been a few times where I've encountered somebody and looked, you know, encountered a woman, a dark headed, you know, woman and automatically said that that's a should be a beta, you know, just, just known it immediately. So, yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Um, and so the, the kind of muttering to yourself, does that yeah. stop at a certain point? Like, is the book on the, sh the book is on the shelf now. Are you still walking around thinking about yeah. scenes for these characters? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think I still yeah. walk around talking to myself. It's a it's a bad habit, I know. But <laughs> oh man, I, yeah. I never should have I never should have committed this to to video. <laughs> oh yeah, no, now it lives on YouTube forever. I know. Um, okay, I'm going to look at some questions. If you have anything, Malcolm, though, jump in. Oh, we have a good question um, for you. What writers do you read for inspiration from Cynthia? Oh, I mean, lots of writers. I mean, I'll, I'll admit to sort of falling back on my handful of favorites, you know, I mean, Michael Ondaatje and Jim Harrison and Larry McMurtry and, you know, Louise Erdrich. And so, oh yeah, I mean, I, I like to read as widely as I can. I don't get to read as much as I would like to read at this point and um, that's kind of one of the weird things about becoming a writer is a lot of your reading time winds up soaked up by trying to produce your own work well you should become an audiobook narrator then you get to read for your job there you go it's a good it works idea very well it works very well yeah um so did you uh well we're just anybody else if anyone has anything let me know um in the meantime, I've been like waiting to do this forever. So I'm just going to keep talking to Malcolm. Um, in how much of the setting, because this is both, both books take place in Montana and you're very familiar with it, obviously, but how much of that is a conscious choice about wanting to, wanting to write about Montana or just feeling like the kind of stories you want to tell are so embedded in the setting that that's, it's, it's necessary. Yeah, I mean, I think one thing that I I grew up with a very mythologized sense of Montana, and and it's still it's still with me. I mean, you know, it's like anything else. Once you move to a place, the reality of it is invariably not quite as you know uniformly grandiose as you anticipated that it would be. But it's still a pretty grandiose state, really, and it's got you know, this, there's a deep pride in place from the people who, you know, are multi-generation and whatnot, um, which I am not. I've lived here for about 30 years at this point. Um, you know, my, when Painted Horses came out, I'd been here for just shy of 20, I guess, but I've been here for nearly 30 at this point. And it does really get into your blood, um, especially if you attach yourself to sort of the the stuff that it's famous for the history and then you know if you like to hunt and fish and you know you like outdoor stuff and you like horses I mean that's that's all it's you know it's Charlie Russell country it's Plains Indian country it's sort of it's everything that I dreamed about as a kid right so yeah well I feel like that and that's why some of those that like I said that discursive passage um about the 
hunting of the the buffalo um i i had never i just this is a part of history i had never seen you know kind of the cowboy and indian thing is just so um it's done at a certain to a certain level and no one is i've i haven't seen somebody writing about that kind of past and so i found that fascinating um is it is that something when you're doing the research are you having better success finding things at this point online or still going into like local museums or local libraries or archives god i mean when i when i did painted horses the the inner the internet then and the internet now are totally yeah. different cats you know with painted horses i had to send away to england for a lot of the stuff to research like the temple dig and the blitz stuff and you know and it was all hard copies of of um monographs from like the you know the museum of london and whatnot whereas today all of that stuff all of that information would be available at your fingertips online and you know, I, I had to get some old airplane building stuff in hard copy for for Cloudmaker. Oh, that's interesting. But I mean, that said, it, it was a night and day different experience in terms of some of the more um, more, I, I guess, like particular research about, you know, there, there's so much more available online at this point. So many. Well, I have to say, I, I do. I have to say that actually when I was recording it, because um, the the audiobook publisher, the producer puts together a really helpful pronunciation guide. They kind of work with Malcolm on making sure everything is pronounced correctly. But some of the words were missed because no one would think that, I, like there was some um, airplane terminology I didn't know. And even I would find myself going down rabbit holes, trying to find pronunciations for this stuff um, mm -hmm. that, I mean, we. I, I told you, I was like, you're gonna have to help me with the gun stuff. I have no idea how to say this. Yeah. 2030. Well, yeah, and and that in particular, I mean, I know you know antique firearms inside and out, so that that's easy. I mean, I can just do that off the top of my head because it's a long-standing interest. Yeah, and that was very helpful. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad. Well, one of the frustrating things um, to people who are reading a book that's set in a in a historical time, if you know anything about the era, and you start to encounter flubs and things that don't totally jibe so yeah i i mean i'm glad that uh that we were able to you know concur or, or confab on that stuff in advance so you're comfortable that it's right you know no it was it was very it was very helpful i mean a lot of the mechanical detail in the book as well like even just me plotting through a sentence to like make sure i understand exactly yeah you know, where the emphasis goes so that it makes sense for the listener. Um, we have a question from Debbie who's saying, I just got the audio version of Painted Horses. I'm wondering if there's something I should keep in mind as I listen to this novel. Ooh, was that for me or for you? I think oh. it could be for both of us. Yeah. You go first. I know. It's like, I kind of just want to say, don't just go in, just go in blind. Um, I, yeah, I don't really want to, I don't really want to give anything away. Yeah, she's saying either, so we can uh, we can both answer. But I I think you're going to be disappointed, Debbie. I don't think we want to give you any clues. <laughs> <laughs> I, I guess the only thing I can say is be be prepared to take some detours away from the the main narrative arc, but be prepared to have them come back around and mean something by the end. That's true. I will say. I mean, one of the reasons that I absolutely love that book is that it's so beautifully written. Um, but it is. It is not strictly literary in that that kind of like no plot literary <laughs> like it is a it is a yarn it is entertaining and that's one thing that i absolutely love about it um yeah yeah well yeah. i mean when i started off with this book i thought well i want to write a you know book about teenage kids who are building an airplane and i thought well what, what would be an antecedent for that and i was just like well what if mark twain was writing this book in the golden age of aviation, but it's one of his sort of like, quote unquote, boys adventure novels, like, you know, Huckleberry Finn or Tom Sawyer. But instead of kids hijacking a raft to go pretend that they're pirates, what if these kids are actually building a functioning airplane that is going to allow them to chase the, you know, the, the dream of flight? And what do they have to fly away from? And I think that's sort of how I, contrived it initially well so 
Okay, this is actually leading to another question because I want to talk about your inclusion of Yakima. Mm -hmm. And so Malcolm brought back a character from Painted Horses um, because this is, uh, well, I was going to say this is like what, 15 years before Painted Horses, but technically he's in the World War II section. So yeah, it's five so, years before Painted yeah, Horses. He's about, yeah, I guess he's appearing about five years earlier than his appearance in Painted Horses. Um, I, this is actually really trippy because since I did Painted Horses, I've recorded, you know, I don't know, 300 other audiobooks. But when I saw him come up, I just like, I remembered doing his voice. He was such a distinct character. Um, and he was so, he was so unique that I, you know, seven years later kind of remembered how I had done this minor character in Painted Horses. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so what, what brought that, uh, what brought him back? For you. Um, partially the fact that he was a really unique character and he was a lot of fun to write uh, the first time around, but he, he only appears in maybe 15 or 20 pages of Painted Horses, um, but he's supposed to be this total technical polymath who can, you know, make, build, craft, create just about anything in a machine shop or with a welder or he's a blacksmith and he's a forger and he can do all this and and i was like well that's that's exactly how i can make this airplane build by a 14 year old kid more plausible if i put a 22 year old yakima mckee on the <laughs> well and he's so hilarious all the time that it, it i just thought I, i'm not i know i'm not done with him as a character i really want to I want to give him a full book to a degree. And you also give him some nice backstory in the book as well. In yeah, one of your I'm kind of in this backstory from clear back in the painted horses days. And I was like, man, I mean, what kind of a person, you know, would he be? And I had made him, you know, sort of out of, you know, out of the, you know, the Mormon culture in Utah, but I was able to really explore that in Cloudmaker. He's great. It's so, it's so fu much fun. A um, couple questions. Um, Another one from uh, Cynthia. So are, it's for both of us. Are we working on anything new now? And how has the pandemic affected your work? <laughs> um, you, you, you go with the pandemic one because you've got right behind. Well, yeah, so oh, this, is, uh, this is this panic room looking thing over here is my booth. Um, so I was, I've been working from home for about seven years, probably. Um, so for me, it wasn't, it wasn't enormously disruptive. I am writing something else. And that was enormously disruptive just because of the kind of, you know, the latent anxiety and stress of this last year. Um, but it is, it is happening. And then luckily, this work continued pretty much unabated. So I've been very fortunate. Malcolm? I, I am a carpenter um, by my day job. And, you know, because I was regarded as, you know, what would be an essential worker, I guess, I, it really didn't affect me too much either. I had certainly had less work to do. Um, I guess the biggest thing really was, I mean, I'm a fairly isolate person anyway, and, and used to a lot of solitude. Um, and so suddenly they're like schools were shut down and kids are home from school. And, you know, my, my wife is a college professor and she had to quickly adapt to this teaching style. This thing, yeah. So suddenly we're all, you know, we were all at the house a lot more than what I, you know, was typically accustomed to during my, you know, standard sort of writing schedule moments. Um, but, you know, still, you know, even adapted to that. I mean, I, I had a pretty big gap and really in, productivity for probably right on through the summer but then when fall came around I you know I kicked back into it and I've been working on a sort of a spec independent television pilot and managed to pound out a draft of that in a few months in the fall and early winter so yeah. that's great I mean I think that generally speaking to answer the question more broadly I'll just go ahead and answer for every writer on the planet um one thing that I th has been said repeatedly when we kind of just lament this it's that even though we tend to be introverted kind of isolated people who don't mind you know periods of um kind of spartan seclusion we are also fed by interacting with people and new settings and um new experiences and when you were looking at the same walls for a year there's something about the creative process just kind of grinds to a halt 
Um, so I think that's been the hardest thing. Like I've been writing a rom-com in a year where like nothing is funny or romantic. Yeah. It's like, this is stupid. Yeah. Um, okay, question uh, from Malcolm. Um, so Huck endeavors to build his own airplane. And they're asking if you, as a carpenter, did you ever go a little method and try to build any part of the airplane to get into Huck's headspace? No, but uh, I- That's a great question. Thank yeah, you. It is. I mean, and there, there is a sort of correlative dimension to it, I think, where just being a person who is used to building a structure that has to have a function, um, probably did play into my ability to write about the the actual nuts and bolts dimensions of building a plane and you know and I did it, sort of in my you know fantasy life I mean it, it was like wow how cool would it be just to be able to build an airplane like this while I'm writing this novel and and then have the the two things sort of come together at the same time. But I mean, honestly, it would have been not a practical situation. Well, because writing because writing a novel is essentially the process of jumping off a cliff and building an airplane on the way down. So like, you don't need to build two. Right. It's true. Yeah. But, <laughs> but, I, but I think that, you know, the fact that I have a, a hands-on skill set undoubtedly sort of helped with the the veracity of oh well that for sure comes through in the in the writing and the technical descriptions of how this thing is built that feels incredibly intact even after it's built the flying just the mechanics of it feel like i said so detailed and so right that um yeah i don't think there's any there aren't yeah. any holes in it thank you I mean, to me, but I haven't built an airplane either, so I don't know. Uh, well, I, mean, I, I had the flight scenes and everything vetted by total pros in the aviation. Oh, nice. Know what they're doing and know what they're looking for and knew what, you know, what was going to ring true and what wasn't. Um, so it wasn't a completely sort of sui generis thing out of my own sensibility by any means, but... Well, that's also see that's another benefit of historical fiction is you're like we're all guessing how they built airplanes back in 1933 and in, in garages in montana yeah like, prove you wrong prove you yeah. wrong well yeah crazily enough too there's still <laughs> this whole like subculture who are building exactly that model of plane around the world i mean they're if you go on these like message boards and things they'll have like 10 12 000 people who are all out there trading, swapping war stories about doing oh this gosh. stuff currently. Isn't that wild? Amazing, amazing. Um, okay, I have one more question for you. And if anyone has another question, throw it up in the chat. Um, but let's, we're gonna wrap this up in five or 10 minutes. Um, do you, Anna would like to know, do you know the backgrounds of the characters beforehand or do you add some of that as they change for you as you write? So do they ever end up really different from who you thought they would be? they don't end up really different from who I thought they would be. Um, I, I think that I, I know I probably most literary fiction writers that I know personally uh, take a much more organic sort of learn as you go approach and, and kind of write their way through to, uh, you know, a characterization that they can then work with. Um, for me, I, I don't know if I'm just more of a control freak than that or, or what, but I, I really have to have a lot of the, the hard and fast, you know, biographies and details and what they look like and everything else, you know, mapped out at least in my head before I start to put them on the page. That yeah. makes sense. That makes sense. Um, okay. There are actually a couple of, sorry, I, I hadn't been looking at the Q and A and now I'm back here. So have you, Gail would like to know, have you read Flight of Passage by Rinker Buck? No, never, never heard of it. Um, okay. I'll look it up. Uh, I mean, yeah, I, now we're, now we're all interested. Yeah. I, I did um, read a lot of old aviation, you know, memoirs and, and things prior to, to get, or even, you know, in, in process while I was, was putting this together. Interesting. There's all, there's always more. Um, okay. So Jennifer says it has been said that you capture a traditionally feminine point of view in sensual scenes. Is this a skill you developed or is it more inherent? Wow. I don't know. Yeah. Let's just crack you open and yeah. <laughs> have a look. Yeah. I guess I'd probably have to have like an analyst or something. Maybe. <laughs> no, I will say I, I actually, I, I will say that that's one thing that I've always, I mean, 
I don't want to, I don't want to generalize. Yeah. But men are not great at writing this stuff and you happen to be great at it. Oh, thank you. And so I, I'm, I'm on board with that too, that I think you, you, um, whatever it is and wherever it comes from, I feel like you have a sensitivity to that tracking the feminine through those scenes in a way like you always see like examples of terrible men like men writing just terrible oh yeah love scenes and it's always like you're yeah. like you don't breasts don't work like that right. um yeah that kind of thing yeah. but uh yeah your sensitivity to that and to the the, the evolution of the character through those scenes i think mm -hmm. is just very very well done I think it's got to be somewhat intuitive, to be honest with you, um, you know, in conjunction with the fact that I, I've always been the person that, you know, going clear back to high school, that the girls and then women were just really comfortable sort of talking to and having like a conversation with about, you know, really intimate things really you know stuff that they wouldn't necessarily just sort of rattle off to any random person um and i guess maybe it, it must be i mean in fact so, i'm a virgo that might have something to do with it i don't know i mean but it, uh my best friend who unfortunately has died now but his his wife at one time told me that she felt like i had female intuition somehow so I don't, yeah, well, I don't there we go. Yeah. Maybe it was your friend's wife that asked the question. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you're not, no, I mean, look, I think, you know, I think that's the point is like, you're, you're clearly, you're a listener and you've managed to, you care enough about character um, yeah. to actually find the nuance in it, regardless of gender. And um, it's just really gratifying. Thank you. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I've always been, you know, fascinated by girls as a kid and fascinated by women as a grown up. So some of it's probably that. Yeah, we're really interesting. You are interesting. We're very complicated. <laughs> very interesting. There's a lot there's a lot of material there. <laughs> um, Malcolm, this was so great. I'm so glad we did this. Um, I think. Ah, ha, ha, she's back. Oh, hi. Wait, we should have done it. I should have like blinked or something or like. <laughs> Oh, that would be the... or like like genie yeah, yeah. <laughs> um y'all this has been so great um i'm so glad that you could both kind of give an hour of your your evening wow. um to spend with us and kind of give us kind of like a peek behind i don't know the kind of book world curtain something that maybe most of us myself included had never really thought that deeply about and especially when we're talking about such like a wonderful book that's like really ambitious in a lot of ways but it never really feels that way when oh, you're reading you. it which is a sign of a good book um this is that good book we've got that's a great cover too book plate editions that's true and it fits really nicely in like my little zoom profile which is nice i don't have to cut anything <laughs> out but um i'm gonna go ahead and drop all these links for y'all but uh first and foremost is the um signed book plate edition first printings of Cloudmaker from our friends at um, Grove, a wonderful publisher, wonderful writer, wonderful audiobook narrator. Um, thank you all so and also, much. Also, I really thank you. I just want to say my little piece <laughs> that I'm really happy that Libro FM is mentioned here. Um, if yes. people don't know how Libro works, do you want to, do you want to yeah. explain? Because it's pretty great. Sure. It's wonderful. Um, it is, um, in short, uh, the independent Bookstore world answer to Audible. Instead of giving your money to Jeff Bezos, you can give the give it to Libro.fm, and um, independent booksellers um, get like a commission. I actually put um, the link in there a couple of times for you to to sign up. It's um, wonderful and ethical and, and really transparent. They're a wonderful team there. So if you ever have any problems, I don't think you will. They will answer them. Uh, Square Books will answer them. We can help you with it too. But if you are an audiobook junkie, but you're also an independent bookstore junkie, Libro.fm, um, they're going to be your people. Um, it's good stuff. And yeah, I, I love them all there. They're, they're really great. And it's like a team of like eight folks. It's incredible. I don't know how they do it. But so yeah, check them out. And um, thanks everybody for, for joining us. Y'all have a good night. Thank you. See you around. All right, y'all take care. Bye. Talk to you soon.
Yes, thank bye. You. Thank you both. Thank you, Malcolm. All right, bye. Thank you.